Mike Snow, I am Dustin Baker. We have arrived at kind of a milestone. Uh, this is the beginning of Vikings rookie minicamp. In about three weeks, we'll have ordinary minicamp. And incidentally, the Timberwolves tried to go up 3-0 tonight on the Nuggets at home at Target Center. But we're going to talk about the Vikings today. Uh, we got a couple of Vikings fans on. I'm going to ask for their bios out of the gate here. Paul, you're joining us. Where are you from? When did you become a Vikings fan? Yeah, so I'm from Faribault, Minnesota, about Sweet. an hour south of the Twin Cities. If you if you know it, you've probably driven by it if you've ever gone south towards the border. Uh, became a Vikings fan in 1998 was when I first really started paying attention. So great year, right? <laughs> Randy Moss went off, did all the good things, and then the Vikings did the most Vikings thing ever and lost the NFC Championship game in heartbreaking fashion. And hence, I got initiated into Vikings <laughs> fandom. Yeah, I uh, I was two years sooner, but I will say that the full investment was the same season as you. So we're kind of bedfellows there. Grill, there he go. goes he goes by Grill. Where where are you from? Where do you live? And I'm gonna guess you came a little bit later than Paul and I. You are correct in guessing that. <laughs> um, so I grew up in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota, born and raised there, but I currently live in Salt Lake City, oh, Utah. Okay. And I've lived here for the last five years or so. Um, I became a Vikings fan. In, my whole family is Vikings fans, but I really started following when Adrian Peterson joined the team as he was such a dynamic player. And um, if I had to point out my first heartbreak, that would be the 08-09 season. Um, but I still hold a grudge against the Saints to this day. Um, but otherwise, um, even though I do live in Utah, I do really enjoy staying engaged with the Vikings community on Twitter and going to road games or even trying to make a home game once a year every now and then. So um, this team has has too much of too much mind share in my brain, but um, I love talking Vikings and and just kind of engaging with the uh, the community of our fan base. Well, you're in the perfect spot. Then let me tell you what, uh, Tyler, how you doing today, producer Tyler? I'm doing good, man. Uh, became a Vikings fan around the same time as Grill. Okay. Uh, you know, Bounty Gate uh, ruined my dreams during childhood, <laughs> and now I have a hatred for the New Orleans Saints as a central florida resident so whenever there's a bucks versus saints game on i'm always rooting for tampa bay that's kind of like you know i can relate to bucks fans a lot easier than most but you know other than that i'm just happy to be on uh so let's get this party rolling guys let's do it all right our first order of business uh is jj mccarthy naturally um and here's the deal i knew that there would be steam about, hey, when's this guy going to start? But I really didn't think it would be this billowy until the summer. Um, and so it was going to be a talking point regardless. But when folks like Paul Allen, who came on our show about a month ago, uh, he said on his show this week that people in the know are starting to tell, tell him that this could be a realistic thing, that McCarthy starts week one. And we know that the Vikings have this, this benchmark plan where McCarthy has to check those boxes. We know that Sam Darnold was signed to a handsome QB2 deal, not necessarily quarterback money, but uh, a large sum for a QB2. So I'm trying to trying to understand, is this McCarthy out of the gate on September 8th or whatever it is, if that's going to be realistic? So, Paul, I'm going to begin with you. I want to know, uh, from your predictive standpoint, are you buying into this? that McCarthy could be ready to go? Or is this just more going to be the Sam Darnold show until McCarthy is truly ready in the middle of the season or something? You know, Darnold, uh, he hasn't had a great opportunity anywhere that he's been, right? Like he started with the Jets, which is a place quarterbacks go to die, and then ended up in Carolina. Not a great situation there either. His one start with San Fran last year was pretty decent. You know, 180 yards, he threw a touchdown, ran another. I think he's the guy at least to start the season and I trust O'Connell, but I sure hope that's the case too. Like McCarthy's 21 years old <laughs> and this is not the season to rush a guy in, right? Like we've got a good team, but there are still gaps next year would be the ideal time for McCarthy to start, right? Cause we've got all that cap space. We can go make some huge moves in free agency next year. We still have our first round pick. Um, let McCarthy sit would, would be the way I'd approach it. And so I'm going to say at, at this point, I'm not buying it. I think he's he's QB2 to start the season, at least. And that's where I'm at, too. Um, 
I guess I'm ready to be blown away this summer. I think we all are by McCarthy. That's the best yeah. case scenario that we just basically have a total redux of what the Texans did last year. That right now is the Holy grail uh, in terms of your, your head coach is that guy. Your quarterback is ready out of the gate. We didn't even think the Texans had enough weapons last summer, but we were wrong. They had more than enough yeah. and now they're rich as hell. And then they had the free agent piggy bank here in March and suddenly they're going to be everybody's trend. Like the lions last year, they're going to be everybody's trendy pick to do fabulous things. Grill, let me take it to you. McCarthy is the steam real about possibly starting out of the gate. I am a believer that he certainly could be the starter out of the gate, but if I had my preference, I would choose not to start him right away. And I think that there's a few reasons why that would be advantageous for for Kevin O'Connell and Quasey and the rest of the staff to take this approach. Um, the first one is, what if J.J. McCarthy struggles the first few weeks? You know this fan base. They are going to freak out online, and <laughs> people are going to be already calling him a bust after four games when nobody should really be thinking like that. So I really think like for the protection of his of his reputation from a certain sense, um, we should consider you know letting Darnold start. Darnold has more experience. And Darnold probably can teach JJ a few things as well, so I would be, I would certainly prefer for JJ to sit. Um, at the same time, though, he could be ready in the sense that Michigan ran so much pro style offense. Jim Harbaugh really put put JJ through a pro style uh, preparation approach every single week. Um, you see it in the film that you watch of JJ McCarthy with his play action capabilities. I think a lot of his um, his pre snap reads and understanding of what the defense is showing him is going to help out in the KOC offense as well. Um, but we do know that there's been so much talk about KOC's offenses is very difficult to pick up right away. <laughs> and I, I really don't want to throw JJ out there until he's fully ready. Um, but, but like Paul said, at the end of the day, I fully trust what KOC's opinion is and whatever he thinks is best. Whenever he thinks JJ is ready, that's when that that's when JJ should, should hit the field. So this show for the months leading up to the draft was notoriously heavy and pro Drake May. And part of the uh, synopsis on him was that he was probably going to have to watch and learn no matter what. Uh, we'll see if the Patriots follow that path. So I think it was ingrained in a lot of the, the Vikings community that, hey, hey they're going to get Drake May and that guy will have to watch. But the perk of McCarthy, his scouting report is the opposite. Like, like Grill just talked about, he was one of the guys, kind of like Caleb Williams, that you should be able to play out of the gate. And the only reason that I would give the, the pro McCarthy week one camp some credence is assuming Aaron Jones is healthy and good, there really isn't a better situation like ever for a quarterback to start out of the gate because you have the weapons galore, depending on when Hawkinson comes back, you have the two offensive tackles, you know, constructed in heaven. And then you have the Brian Flores defense that climbed from 24th in DVOA in 2022 under Donatel to 11th best and the new personnel on defense on top of it. So if you're going to size up how a QB one could thrive out of the gate, I don't know if the Vikings are absolutely perfect, but they would be up there if there were power rankings of situations in the last decade or so. Tyler, you're you're in the process of warming up to J.J. McCarthy. What, what say you on this week one stuff? Yeah, I, I don't think it's all that likely. And it's mainly just because, you know, he, he has to learn the offense. And you can point to a lot of the similarities between Michigan's offense and some of the stuff that Kevin O'Connell intends to run. But at the end of the day, it's still a completely different offense. So, like, Adam Thielen once described the Kevin O'Connell offense <laughs> is one of the – or the hardest he's ever had to learn. And Adam Thielen is, like, a super bright, intelligent guy. Uh, so, I expect J.J. McCarthy to just have to sit out of necessity while he, you know, gets himself fully acclimated to – understanding the verbiage of this offense and everything that's required of him uh, because it's, it's not like he's this generational prospect in terms of just like pure athleticism and upside where like, if he doesn't know, you know, how to change calls at the line of scrimmage because he doesn't really know the verbiage quite yet. Um, then like, that's a lot of his game. I, I think JJ McCarthy, one of his strengths, uh, is the mental component 
like, hey, you know, I see this, I'm going to change it to that. Like being able to call an audible and having great situational awareness. But that also needs to be developed a little bit in the NFL. You can't really have situational awareness if you don't really understand what the situation you're in is. So that's why I think, you know, Darnold's going to have to start week one. And if something happens to Sam Darnold and you're looking at, uh, you know, a battle for QB2, um, cause I'm, I wasn't really sold on Mullins last year. I know he threw for 400 yards, but it felt like every drive ended in a turnover, even if you were in field goal range. So it made me want to tear my hair out. Um, but yeah, I would expect Sam Darnold to start week one. On, on that, I say this about every other show, but for any newcomers, uh, I want to get this out there. I am not a big Sam Darnold proponent. I never have been, um, but uh, he's a Viking now, so I don't have any choice. I am here to report that I swear to God, it will be a very Minnesota vikings s thing for Sam Darnold to be too good to bench. And I'm talking for the long haul in the season. And we could get absurd on this too. If we're talking like the turn of October, four or five games played, son of a bitch has 12 touchdowns, one pick, 1,400 yards. It could be that extreme in this offense if he finally fulfills his scouting report from USC six years ago. And uh, not that I think he's really capable of doing that, but I know that the cynicism that a lot of us have say, of course, that's going to happen. And then you're going to have the people that say you can't bench this guy. And we're like, well, we just drafted this other guy who's going to take over whether you like it or not. It, it's, it's so tailor made for there to be a controversy when we really don't need it. So I fully expect that to happen, even though I have the dichotomy of not being a big Sam Darnold guy. All right, let's roll into some sleepers. I want to, I want the, the viewers to start thinking about <clears throat> roster battles because that'll be a big topic on this show. Paul, I'm going to start with you. Let me set this up. In 2021, K.J. Osborne waltzed into the summer, and we're like, this dude didn't even catch a pass the year before. What's he going to do? Lo and behold, he became the WR3 that we all craved for the entire Zimmer era. The following year, a guy nobody had heard of called Ky Kyrus Tonga came out of nowhere and was a decent nose tackle for the Vikings. Last year, Luke Braun was the only human being that identified Najee Thompson as a guy who could make the roster. Last three years, we have notable examples of sleeper candidates that effectuated their sleeper profile and made the team and had an impact. Paul, who's that guy for the 2024 Vikings? I'm probably going to catch some flack for this, and that's okay. Um, I'm intrigued by Doug Nestor. Yeah. Offensive lineman they picked up. Um, yeah. Undrafted free agent. Right? He was a multi-year starter out of West Virginia. Um, played guard most of his college career. Moved out to tackle last year. Didn't allow a sack in... I don't know, 600 some odd snaps, something like that, right? So he's he's a capable offensive lineman, right? Is versatile and he's big. He's like six foot six, 310 pounds, something like that. So he's a big dude, just the kind of guy we need on the interior. I'm not saying he's going to start out the gate. <laughs> and again, nobody's talking about him, but I'd love to see him make the team. And I think, you know, just based on our lack of depth at the interior, offensive line position he's he's a guy i'm going to be paying attention to this summer i have to ask because that's a deep cut like you know on an album where did you how did you become a nester guy is this like your your uncle or something or no, no or just say your uh, cousin <laughs> um just just digging through kind of the undrafted guys right because okay. we we didn't get to draft a lot of guys and so <laughs> looking at these guys and all the big names everybody's talking about right i mean the one draft pick that i'm stoked about is our kicker just mm -hmm. we went out and got a solid kicker. He should make the team because the other guy came from the U UFL, XFL, you know, mm -hmm. whichever league he was in before. Um, so, yeah, that's exciting. But Doug Nestor, it's like that's we need a big guard, right? Our problem on the interior of the O-line has been size. Look at Garrett Bradbury. He gets forklifted all the time. <laughs> um, what, he was marginally better last year. But, you know, we need some size on the interior of the O-line. And so a big guy like this gets me excited. I'm glad you brought him up because we will we'll bookmark this. This is the first Nestor uh, mention on this show. And if he turns out to make the 53-man and beyond, we'll be like, oh, well, remember that uh, that May afternoon when Paul called it? <laughs> um, all right, Grill, how about a, a sleeper for you? I'm Or Tyler, what you got? Yeah, uh, so real quick, Paul, um, we're in the process of contacting a bunch of different Vikings players' agents. We might have to contact Doug <laughs> Nestor and have you ask him some questions because that was incredible. 
we're well, this is a pro nester show now uh because <laughs> we might be the first <laughs> podcast to bring him up that's a uh, sleeper of sleepers uh all right grill um i'm gonna guess yours is not nester so who do you got yeah, I, I did not go as deep as as Paul did. I'm, I'm kind of taking a different angle with this one. Yeah. And I'm excited to see what Makai Blackman is going to do in okay. year number two. I think when you talk about the Brian Flores defense and you think of who are some of the most dynamic players that we have, it's often Metellus, it's often Ivan Pace, it's often um, Harrison Phillips, now the new guys, Grenard Van Ginkle. But um, there's – and Dustin, you also brought up the fact that we're talking about um, – position battles as well. CB2 appears to be open at this mm-hmm. time. And I think Makai Blackman is going to be the guy that's going to take that next step to earn himself a starting position and more reps within the Flores defense. Um, M- Makai Blackman outperformed his expectations last year as a rookie. He actually earned the fourth best uh, rookie cornerback grade, according to Pro Football Focus beating out guys like Joey Porter Jr., mm-hmm. who many Vikings were pounding or many fans were pounding the table for in the first round of last year. Um, I was too. I was too. <laughs> and and so I'm, I think that he's not necessarily super underrated. I think everyone who watches the games and follows closely understands that that this guy has potential and, and he has a lot of fight within him. But um, I'm excited to see kind of what he does in year two. And the, the Caleb Evans, Andrew Booth, those situations kind of feel up in the air at the moment. I'm not sure whether they're going to improve or decline with the, the next upcoming season. Um, Shaq Griffin, he's probably going to get reps at this point, just given the the status that he already has and, and Byron Murphy as well. But um, I'm excited to see what Makai Blackman can do in year two and with an improved pass rush as well with those um, three edge rushers all going after the quarterback. Hopefully that means less time that these guys have to hold on for dear life in the secondary. So, yeah, I uh, I'm a Blackman guy as well, and I can't for the life of me understand why the fan base isn't over the moon about him. Uh, you mentioned the PFF grade, um, especially among rookies, it was 32nd amongst all cornerbacks on yeah. any given Sunday. What 96 cornerbacks are on a football field, and when you have that dazzling of a mid round rookie. We should treat him like Ivan Pace, but we don't. We're like, nope. I think it's because he got out jumped in a Denver Bronco and against the Broncos. Uh, and I, I, I tweeted something to the fact earlier this week about uh, Blackman's PFF in a meme, and somebody was like, "Well, he got cooked down the stretch of the season." I was like, "Oh, a rookie had some mistakes. Oh, boy, who could have seen that coming?" Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the guy was game ready. He got substantial playing time, and he did what was asked when called upon. And if you assume he doesn't have a sophomore slump. Uh, I agree that we should be we should be like just just like Ivan Pace. We should be like, yeah, we got Blackman, we got Pace, but it's always just Pace. Uh, so we shall see if Blackman has the oomph to avoid a sophomore slump and win that either slot job or CB two job um, this summer. Uh, Ty- Ma- Tyler, mine is giving Blake Brandle the benefit of the doubt. Now I know that uh, he's not a big sexy solution. But I think when Vikings fans examine guard in the offensive line on the whole, we do through with our Mike Zimmer goggles on. And we're like, well, that guy ain't going to work. But if this group, who's been offensive line focused and for the most part successful, if they think Brandel's ready, who am I to say, nope, that ain't going to work? Um, I just don't understand why we would be so low on a guy that's nominated by this regime who has markedly improved the offensive line with the snap of a couple fingers. So Brando would be my sleeper is that he turns out to be a good starter rather than some turnstile that we seem to perceive him at at the moment. Tyler, who's your sleeper? Yeah, my sleeper is someone that uh, the fan base was very high on until they absolutely weren't. And I'm talking, <laughs> of course, about Jaron Hall. Uh, oh, wow. Listen. Uh, Where the hell thing. does he fit? Yeah, so well, I, I alluded to the battle for quarterback two earlier, and I legitimately still think that Jaron Hall has a chance to beat out Nick Mullins for that job. Even though Nick Mullins is sort of the established veteran, um, the Vikings drafted Jaron Hall in the fifth round for a reason. They could have taken a position of need. They didn't. Um, the Vikings have, you know, two to three year plans for what they're going to do between drafts. And is Jaron Hall the franchise guy? Absolutely not. Right. You drafted JJ McCarthy to be that guy. But Jaron Hall, if something happens to Sam Darnold, 
he could be the bridge guy. He could be the, oh, we don't want to put in Nick Mullins because he's bland and unexciting and throws turnovers. We need someone with a bit more athletic upside who understands the offense. That could be Jaron Hall. Now, personally, I view last year as a complete wash for him. He was still picking up the offense. He was in no position to start and was thrown out there last minute to the Wolves against Green Bay because it was like the last week of the season. And all of our other options from Dobbs to Mullins weren't working. And it was a last ditch Hail Mary effort. And he played poorly. You know, he also had that one drive against the Falcons that looked good and then he got hurt. Mm -hmm. So your sample size for what he can actually do is like non existent. And he didn't really know the offense. So, you know, he's entering a second year where he's not having to worry about learning as much of the installs. You know, he'll start to see things more clearly, you know, make more decisive decisions because of that. And look, I'm not saying it's a lock that he's quarterback too. He really has to earn it in camp and throughout the offseason program. But like, there's a chance. Like, this team, this coaching staff invested a fifth round pick in him for a reason. And we don't have a ton of draft capital for next year's draft. So what if there's a team out there that needs, you know, a veteran backup quarterback and they want to trade like a seventh round pick for Nick Mullins? Would the Vikings do that? Would they roll with Darnold, McCarthy and Hall as their three quarterbacks and just, you know, go all in on the youth movement? Like, I think that's a possibility. So Jaron Hall, his story isn't over yet. I think fans wrote him off because of the bad, you know, Green Bay game. But he could be like a Davis Mills for us, like a really high quality young backup quarterback for this team. And it's also worth noting if if Cousins had been re-signed, we'd have a completely different trajectory for Jaron Hall, at least how we thought about him, because he'd be the guy that we would say, hey, maybe he still has something. And yeah, I'm with you, Tyler, that even though he sucked against the Packers last year, it's like, well, that was kind of going to happen. He's a fifth round rookie. You threw him into the fire. This is what happens. So I am there. And then uh, Nick Mullins was acquired two summers ago for a late round trade with the Raiders. So uh, in theory, that could happen again and it'd be kind of a, a wash. All right, let's talk about wide receiver. The top of the ticket is spoken for. Assuming there's no injuries, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison will dazzle. Uh, we hope TJ Hawkinson is ready sooner than later. But after that, it's like uh, the Vikings either have a really sweet confidence in one of three or four dudes, or they forgot about WR3, which is highly <laughs> unlikely. So, Paul, I'm going to ask you right now, I think most of us have uh, labeled Trent Sherfield, Brandon Powell, and Jalen Naylor as the WR3 candidates. I guess you could get frisky and say Tristan Jackson or something like that. But do you trust the winner of that camp battle to be the WR three in September. I don't know why we're not talking about Nikhil Harry guys. Yeah. No, no I'm, ki I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Before Vikings Twitter kills me. Like I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, Brandon Powell looks sharp last year, right? Mm -hmm. Like when, when Jefferson went down, Brandon Powell, you know, he wasn't blowing the doors off of anybody, but he was getting open. He was making good catches in my mind. He's the pretty clear wide receiver three on this team. Um, Jalen Naylor, I'd love to see the guy be successful. Mm -hmm. And I know he's had some injury stuff, but if he wants to have a shot at it, he's got to stay healthy and he's got to show out in camp and preseason and show that he can be the guy. Um, but I think right now it's Brandon Powell's job to lose. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, Powell did himself such an enormous favor when he caught that game winning touchdown against the Falcons because that won the hearts of Vikings fans. Um, on Naylor, I kept thinking repeatedly last year, when Jefferson was hurt, man, that guy, that everything was just set up for him to ascend, but he was hurt. I think it was a concussion again or something. And so now we're getting into year three where he has to win this camp battle or at least become the bona fide WR4 and get a little attention in the offense. Otherwise, he's not really going to cut it. Um, but Grill on this WR3 thing. We're kind of throwing it back a little bit to how the Vikings used to do things when it was either BC Johnson or Chad Beebe. I remember those summer battles thinking like, when will we ever be like those other teams? Now Powell and Sherfield and Naylor is certainly an upgrade over those. But in terms of 
being affluent on offense. These Vikings have shown time and time again, you know, getting Cam Akers last September. They want to get, you know, all the talent they can. Does it surprise you that it's only those three guys we've talked about? And do you trust the winner of that battle for September? I, I, I trust the winner of this battle, but ultimately my prediction for how wide receiver three unfolds is I think that Powell will get 60% of the WR3 reps. I think Sherfield gets about 40%. And that's because Sherfield's run blocking ability is very, very good. And I think that he's going to kind of replace that role that Osborne did in the blocking game when we're running. And um, also, if, if we're down TJ Hawkinson as well for a few games to start the season, we're going to need more help from kind of the uh, perimeter players to to block on some of our wider zone run, running scheme games. Um, I would like to see us potentially, you know, tap the kick the tires on Michael Thomas or Zay Jones, but I don't really think that's happening. Um, and I don't want Michael Thomas on my team. So there's that too. Um, but otherwise, I think that Naylor – you can't make the club in the tub is what they say. And this dude just can't get healthy, which really is too bad because I think he's had a lot of potential and promise from that rookie season or even those couple games we've seen. I do remember one game, I think it was in Green Bay when it was kind of a, a blowout, but he, he stood out in the in the second half and, and played well. Um, so ultimately, I think it comes down to, to Naylor winning the job primarily and getting most of the targets from a wide receiver standpoint for WR3. But don't sleep on Sherfield, man. I think that he's going to get on the field more than we think. And obviously, he'll be on the field for special teams as well. In free agency, there's been a whirlwind of teams signing WR3s. And I think, Grill, you said that they're probably content because otherwise, where are they? You know, Why don't you go get somebody? They've yeah. watched, I think, five dudes in the last week go off the board from Claypool to Beckham, Chark, Allen Robinson. And there's one more that's escaping me, um, probably. Or Tyler Boyd, the big one. Yes. Uh, so right now, it's down to, for guys that would probably be nominated as a right-away WR3, Hunter Renfro, Zay Jones, and then Michael Thomas. And I'd assume he'd be healthy for half the season. Uh, maybe by the time Hawkinson's back, that's when he gets hurt or something. Uh, Tyler, what say you to round out the show? Are you cool with the current WR3 options, or would you like them to get one of those guys? Julio Jones is out there. MVS is out there. Yeah, um, I I think it's increasingly likely that they just stand pat at wide receiver three. Um, you know, like Grill said, uh, Sherfield was brought in as like, you know, your run blocking receiver. Um, and, you know, he can do a little bit as just, you know, in terms of being a pass catching threat, but not much. It's not remarkable. There's a reason why he was a free agent. Um, Powell still has potential. Again, it's just injuries. And then, uh, or not Powell, excuse me, Naylor. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think Powell stays in the same role that he was last year as sort of your, your punt returner, wide receiver four kind of guy. Um, as someone who covers the Dolphins, um, I will say that they are very dependent or were last year on just like Tyree Hill and Jalen Waddle. And then there were a couple other guys after that, like Braxton Berrios and, you know, River Carcraft and like the, these other guys, but they didn't really have a true established wide receiver three. And that might be the case for the Vikings. They might, there might not be a true winner for wide receiver three it just might mean more jordan addison targets which is really exciting to have him be closer to the 1b to jefferson's 1a instead of targeting jefferson a million times on offense <laughs> and you know everyone else kind of after that it might be closer to a dig stealing that we had in previous years uh than a jefferson heliocentric offense so that's my prediction is uh, don't sleep on Jordan Addison having an even better 2024 season than he did last year in terms of just receptions per game, yards per game. Um, they're really going to want to unlock him on offense. Yeah, and I think we would welcome that if it was some rendition of like the the Buccaneers with Mike Evans or Chris Godwin, and then of course Jefferson would be the you know the, the pace setter. Uh, but yeah, WR three will continue to be intriguing. Um, and I like the theory of that maybe it'll just be a conglomeration. Uh, because I I keep coming back to if if TJ Hawkinson had never succumbed to that gross hit from the Lions, I don't think we'd really care about this because we'd already know in our heart of hearts that Hawkinson gets the WR three targets and the other guys just bop 
mop up duty. Um, so hopefully that means Hawkinson will be back sooner than later. All right, Paul, any closing arguments before we log off for Friday? Sorry. That's all good. There for a second. Um, no, no closing arguments at this point. I mean, I think it's an exciting time to be a Vikings fan. Yeah. Which we literally say every year. No, but, not, not I mean, like this. <laughs> that it, it is truly an exciting time. Um, you know, after this year, we've got all that cap space. We've got a good roster this year. Um, I think the Vikings will be above average this year. And then next year could be just straight up incredible. Um, so exciting times. Can't wait to see what they do when we get to September. And uh, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Um, we also have a schedule release five days from now, which will give us a little more clarity on what the lay of the land looks like, possibly for you know rookie quarterback taking over. Grill, closing argument from you? Same same opinion as Paul. I think this yeah. is a very exciting time to be a Vikings fan. I, I know personally I'm super excited to read this summer once we get into training camp how J.J. McCarthy is performing relative to Brian Flores's defense and the schemes that he's thrown at him in practice. Talk about – you know, welcome to the NFL. Here, you're going to practice against Brian Flores for for three to four weeks, and then you know the intra squad practices against one or two other teams as well. Um, and preseason football is going to be fun for the first time oh, in a gosh, while. Oh gosh, yeah. You know, KOC doesn't play starters very much, but um, we're going to be watching a rookie quarterback. It's, it's must see TV, people. So, um, I'm my expectations are relatively you know t tampered for this year. We're going to be middle of the road, but, but that's okay. I think 25 and 26, those are our years where, where we go get it. So um, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We had this progression of preseason football where we, we were dragged with Sean Mannion for three or four preseasons. Last year he was in the mix, but not until October on my damn birthday they signed him. I was like, really? <laughs> uh, so it was the Jaron Hall show last year. And then now we have you know the utopian preseason, assuming that McCarthy plays. I think he will. Uh, so there's something certainly to watch for. Uh, Tyler, closing arguments before we are finished. Yeah, uh, I really hope the Viking social media team gives us every possible uh, angle <laughs> of that rookie minicamp practice. I bet uh, they will. You know, I, I want to see J.J. McCarthy throwing some absolute bullets out there. And, you know, uh, number 33 is back, uh, but it's not Dalvin Cook. It's Aaron Jones. So just seeing a running back wear 33 in practices will, will be pretty fun. And then also the Timberwolves, you know, mm -hmm. first home playoff game uh, in the Western Conference semis in like 20 years. Yep. So really looking forward to that as well. On the, the two items in finality, they're mentioned by Paul and Grill about a new new era. If you sit down and crunch out the depth chart, um, so, you know, there's 11 positions on each snap, offense and defense. The Vikings are on tap to probably have between – nine and 12 new starters altogether. So if you go on starting personnel, that's about half the damn team that's new. So there is reason if when Paul says this feels different, we say that every year, but this one really does feel different. And mainly let's face it. It's because Kirk has gone to the Falcons and the competitive rebuild now has a new face. It was always changing and charging for the last two off seasons. People didn't believe it, but now that cousins is gone, who was like the face of the franchise at QB one next to Jefferson, uh, it's, it's in our face and palpable. All right, gentlemen, thank you for joining. Uh, you let us know when you're available to come back on. We'll love talking to both of you. And yeah, get ready for all those sweet uh, McCarthy highlights that should dribble out this afternoon. Take it easy, guys. Thank Later. you. Thank you.